Alrighty guys, welcome back to another Stitch With Me. We're going to stitch for the next roughly hour or so. Uh, and today we are restarting the dachshund piece. So we'll talk about why I'm restarting it here in a little bit, but I just wanted to let everybody know we're restarting it. Got my floss. Organized a bunch of my floss this uh, this past week. And look at all the look at all the purple. The purple is for all the purple purple everywhere. So we're gonna and I'm gonna start from scratch. I've got my fabric here that I got from the stitching shop and I'm gonna pull it out and I'm gonna show you guys how I would sort of set up my, my gridding. Now it's not gonna be perfect because I'm certainly not perfect. And you may want to do this in a different way because it suits you better and that's fine. Whatever works for you and whatever turns out the best for you is totally cool man. It's totally cool. So let's see here. So Gotta make sure that you orient your fabric the right way, right? So I know for a fact, because I've already done this once, that my pattern is longer this way than it is that way. So the length is longer than the width. So I can actually pull it out and look at it and go, aha, that is where I should start. So I always start in the upper left corner. And the reason why I start in the upper left corner is because I don't like the idea in a full coverage project of coming to the middle, stitching the middle page, and then moving page by page by page. Part of it is just, I know I'm gonna screw it up. I know I'm gonna get off a row or do something wrong and then I'm gonna have a massive amount of um, stuff to put together. But it also is just from a standpoint of, I like when I do cross stitch, or let me pull this back out. I like when I do a full stitch, a full coverage cross stitch, starting up at a point and filling it in as you go. I just, I like that, like printing a page in a sense. So that's another reason why I do it. You don't have to. You can start in the center if you want to. It doesn't matter. Whatever works for you, right? So then, I didn't bring my ruler up, but roughly, and I cut my thumb again. We'll talk about that. Um, roughly, I'll just kind of estimate about three inches down, three inches across. I don't have to be perfect with this because a good, a good somebody who can frame is going to block out the rest of this anyway. So... Um, if I say, and I got my little marking pen, fine point mark begun. Um, and so I've got the friction pens around here somewhere and I use those as well, but this was the one that I had handy. So, um, the little hamster over there is making noise. So if I roughly say, let me just, let me just do it with my, you know, my, my so-called ruler here, let me get it in place here. Um, so if that's, say that's roughly... I know it's not, but roughly an inch, roughly an inch, roughly an inch across. Ah, let me get roughly an inch across, and then roughly an inch, roughly an inch, roughly an inch down, roughly. And then I might even like cheat and go back up a little bit. But I'm gonna start it about right here. So got my marking pen. I know that that's probably too far over. It's okay. It's going to be okay. Usually I start too close to the corner and then everything's lopsided on the other end. So it's no big deal. Um, so I'm just going to start by gridding out some 10 by 10 grids here to correspond with my pattern. And I'm just going to start by going all the way down, going all the way across. And then I'm going to try and count. This is hard. The pressure the pressure of counting to 10 in front of you guys and getting it right. You think I'm joking, I'm not. Um, <laughs> as far as counting the, the things, because I don't have my glasses, oh, I'm glassless. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, so roughly, I'm gonna make a mark there um, as a kind of a, hmm, I think that's 10, and then I go back. So I go one, two, three, four, five, Okay, so that's right. And then I will make my other vertical mark here. And then uh, I'll make one more row. I don't, need to, I don't need to grid out the entire first page right now. I don't wanna do that for this stitch with me, but I do wanna get some stuff done so we can stitch a little bit. One, two, three, four, five, six, And the reason why, you may look at this and go, well, that doesn't look hard at all. But let me tell you, you go cross-eyed as you go across, as you're counting these. Sometimes you can, if you don't, if you blink, you're, you're lost. you got to start over. Um, so, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
Okay, perfect. I'm two for two. I'm starting off good this morning. We're going to also talk about the honey extraction that we did yesterday. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in the video. And I'm going to talk about the dachshund. We're going to talk about some aquarium stuff. we got all kinds of things to talk about today. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, see, I blinked and I missed it. Now, here's another thing too. So if I, I basically want to do some horizontal lines here. So sometimes it's easier instead of counting down because for some reason I, I have a hard time with that, I'll just turn the fabric and count right to left like I did. Well, I was doing it left to right, but it's just easier for me. Three, four, five, six. So again, I'm just going to make a little save mark um, so that I can go back and count again. Okay. So if this mark was wrong, then all I would do is if I needed to move it up or down, I would just fill in the whole thing and then I would know as I stitch that I, that that mark wasn't right because I only marked a little bit. Also, when you're using the marking pen, don't be afraid to just touch, go ahead and touch the squares because touching the squares um, is no big deal. It's, um, you know, this stuff washes off. If you, In case you're wondering with this pen, um, cold water, hot water, doesn't matter. This stuff washes off really, really easily. The, the, the link for this pen is down below if you want to use this. And I think I'm also going to actually um, make this a separate, like, how to grid video, so to speak. And so just for those that that still want to just see what I do. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, perfect. So, and you also see that I, I go out beyond the, um, the point of where I stitch, or sorry, the point, it, well, yeah, so this is the border of where I stitch, and I do the marking beyond the border. Now, the reason for that is because as I stitch down, um, if I want to go ahead and so say I well anyway say I say I stitched like all of this and then I stitched a couple rows here and I wanted to just go ahead and continue gridding say I don't grid the whole page at one time or something um, this basically gives me an idea that I went ahead and I can count from out here and not have to worry about counting the rows of floss which you can do it either way but I just found especially in some of my smaller projects like my 18 count projects that um, having an overlap like this makes it just easier to to count going forward. So um, I'm just gonna stop here with the gridding, but you can see um, you know, how it goes. And uh, it's one of those things that, um, this is 14 count fabric, so it's a lot easier than doing something that's really, really small. Um, this pen works great for 14 and 18, but anything smaller than that, I, you'd have to be really good, and I'm not at gridding. So uh, that would be something else to do. So, all right, and the other thing, uh, that I also also have questions about and I did I did do a video on this and so you see how like you've got your fold lines um, your fabric fold lines in your Ada now you notice that maybe on this one it doesn't look like it is that um, hard and stiff and that's because it's a slightly better quality of Ada I get it from a stitching shop like I said link down below um, the better quality Ada the softer the fabric is the less problems you're gonna have with how how hard it is to deal with it first. Now, there, like I said, there is a video, I'll put it up here on how to soften your Ada when you first get it. Um, basically, it just involves, uh, you know, putting some warm water on it or any kind of water really um, to kind of break these bonds of, of, of how sharp these are. Um, but um, it's one of those things where uh, it's, it really is like the quality of fabric. So if you get fabric, and I used to get fabric from like Michaels and Hobby Lobby, the stuff that's kind of um, like rolled up um, and it doesn't have the lines because it's rolled up but it's still super stiff and you'll have to um, definitely get out the um, you know wash it so you soften it and everything so oh, okay so next up we're gonna get our hoop out here and uh, I got the other piece of it down here and I use the plastic hoops and as far as where I position it I just want to position it in a place where I can work on this upper left corner fairly reasonably fairly reasonably bring it down I don't want to get I, I like I don't want to get well I'm not even showing you guys I don't want to get like the um, like okay so if I do this here 
See how little fabric I have? Ah, see how little fabric I have? And that's gonna be hard for me to like pull it through um, to tighten it. So I'm just gonna move my hoop bottom, the bottom hoop down a little bit more. Oh, I'll do a little bit more. Move it over here a little bit more. Put what you want to stitch a little bit more in the center. I can't really because of the lack of fabric up here. Ah, I did it again. I can't really because of the lack of fabric, but I have more fabric now to hold on to. So as I just tighten this. The other thing that people worry about is hoop lines in your fabric. What if you leave your um, hoops in your fabric all the time and you pull it out and oh my goodness, you have a hoop line. Don't worry about it guys, seriously. It goes away. Um, it goes away when you wash it. It goes away with normal time. Let me show you an example here with uh, Rainy Waterloo Place here. So Rainy Waterloo Place, I have been working on this project for, I don't know, a couple years now, at least a year and a half. And I have left the hoop in at different times. And can you tell? The only place you can really tell is right here but I, I leave the hoop in all the time and you can't tell once you stitched, once the fabric softens up especially and it kind of lays around for a bit, it's totally fine. Don't worry about it, it's all good. Now, if it's linen, let's say this, if it's linen and it's really nice fabric and it's a really special kind of linen, I probably would take, I mean, I think it's still probably okay, but since it's your linen and not my linen, I would take the hoop out just to be safe. But on Ada, don't worry about it. It's one of the reasons why I like Ada. I know not everybody does. Um, a lot of people like the specialty fabrics and that is awesome because they are gorgeous. But when I'm doing full coverage, a full coverage project, I don't think it matters a whole lot to me like that I'm using Ada versus something else, some other kind of stuff. Um, honestly, I, that's one way that I save money is by doing full coverage projects having them take a long time, but then just saving money on the ADA. I spend a little bit more because I'm getting a better quality ADA, but then, <clears throat> excuse me, but then I, um, but I'm happy with it because it's just, it's a good quality fabric and it's one of those things that stands up to a couple years of use, you know? All right, let me find some floss. We haven't even stitched yet. We're like almost done with our video. No, we're not almost done with our video. We're not almost done. Ah, my hands are a mess today, and we'll get into that in here in a second. So, oh man, here we go. To the person that reached out to Christine at a stitching shop yesterday, um, she messaged me. <laughs> and told me that somebody had called and asked about what project um, or where did I get my Westminster Abbey project. And um, first of all, I will say that anything I've ever stitched on, I'm currently stitching or have stitched on, is on, I believe it's on the blog, which is again down below, uh, stitchingjewels.com. And um, it'll tell you where to get it. There's a link for where to get it. Um, but it was from KDA. And it's very small. Oh, you know what? I don't even know if I have KDA on my on my designer or my pattern site places. But KDA has um, some very interesting stuff. I don't know how like they get what they get. I don't know if they've just if they had all these patterns at one point and now they don't design anything new. I'm not really sure. I haven't gone back and looked through the website in a while. But the Westminster Abbey that I have is absolutely gorgeous. And um, um, it's, it's on my website and so, but, uh, but I had to, but she reached out to me yesterday and was like, Hey, where'd you get that? And so that was funny. Um, of course I couldn't talk to her because no, I'm not doing the loop method. I didn't prepare well enough to do the loop method. Just doing my old standard old fashioned cross stitch cause I'm old and I'm fashioned in a certain way. Okay, first stitch done, dachshund part two. We're gonna do it this time, guys, because it's 14 count, and 14 count is the awesomest. Well, I think it's the awesomest. Oh, this feels so much better to be stitching on 14 count than that little 18 count. I'm telling you guys, I'm serious about that. All right, so anyways, we're gonna stitch for a while. Now we're, now we're in our talking phase. 
Oh, I'm so tired. Okay, so wait, I'm going to stop for a second and show you. So I split my thumb again yesterday during all the honey extraction, and I split it really bad. Um, and I, I've been putting stuff on it and everything, but this is my weak spot. This is definitely like the spot that if I'm going to have a problem with, if I'm over, if I'm abusing my hands, this is what breaks apart first. But I also got a big blister, like, or I shouldn't say a blister. It was more like a wear spot. The blister never was able to form because I kept, I kept messing with it, messing with it. And it just, I put some, um, that Burt's Bees, um, bag bombs, not bag bomb, but it's that skin restore. I'll, I'll show it to you later. Um, I put some of this on it last night and this looks so much better and it actually feels really good. I did the same thing to this finger all the way down the finger. I, and I honestly, I don't know what I did. Um, but all the way down was like, sort of like a blister without a blister. Um, like the skin just wore off and I just, I just wore off the, ins the, the first part of that. And then I also have that right there. That really tried to blister, but I kept I kept rubbing off the skin on that one, and I need to put some more stuff there. Um, a little bit right there too, and even this morning, like it, I don't I didn't callus or anything, but all that right there, all the honey extraction stuff, and my hands. I don't know how long I can stitch today, guys, because I mean my hands are hurting; they're sore, and so. Um, so honey extraction. We're gonna get a video. I got a lot of videos to put together today. Um, and, uh, that is one of them. We pulled in excess of 95 pounds of honey this year. Um, we're very happy. We're a little disappointed. We kind of thought we'd get more than that, but, um, which sounds, it sounds incredibly ungrateful, but we are so grateful for what we got because, um, last year was a lot. Last year was like 17 pounds. And it was a bad year. And so this year was much, much better. Um, but it, there definitely was like, there was a point where the bees definitely stopped making honey. Um, I don't know, because it, it's, we're supposed to have like a colder winter, like the fall winter is supposed to be harsher than it has been in other times here. And so um, it's one of those things that uh, um, it may have caused them to stop producing and start kind of I don't know. I'm not sure. But so yesterday morning we got up and we left the house at about 6.30. Drove the hour down to where the bees are and um, pulled the honey. Now what I mean by pulling the honey is basically you go into each hive and when you look at a beehive, there are what they call deep boxes or just deeps. And then there are supers or super boxes. And deep boxes... There's going to usually be two. Um, one deep box is going to be where the bees kind of congregate, and especially in the wintertime, um, protect themselves um, from heat and uh, from heat, from cold and all that good stuff. There's going to be another one where there's the frames on them are large, large frames, 10 frames usually, and filled, packed with honey, just packed with, it's like, think of it as like just the winter stores of food. And then usually above that, we'll place a smaller box. It'll be a thinner, you know, like if a deep is like 16 inches or so, and I can't, I can't remember the dimensions off the top of my head, then the, um, the supers are more like 10 inches or something. They're just smaller. The frames are smaller. Um, and we put a special metal divider called a queen excluder, um, on top of the deeps to separate the deeps from the supers. And what that basically is is smaller bees can get through, but the queen, she's larger, she can't fit through it, and so she can't go up in there and potentially get lost, and you know she needs to stay down below. And so what we do with the honey supers is, well, the bees basically is, if they've got room to make honey, they'll just keep making honey. They'll just keep laying down more honey and getting it ready for the winter. And so what we do is we go in and we basically take those supers and put everything kind of, make the hive a lot smaller again. Bees don't really care for that. Um, where there are um, bees on the supers, we have to brush them off back into the hive. They get really mad. They were really mad at us yesterday. Um, we've got, we had I think five hives we were able to take honey from of the seven total um, and 
a couple of them were really mad. I mean, like, in our, we wear full bee suits and they're like dive bombing us in the face and stuff, trying to get through our veil. And, um, and so thankfully we were pretty safe inside of our full bee suits. Although it is still possible to get stung through the veil, um, meaning on your face. There was a picture of a guy yesterday that was extracting his honey. And sometimes what will happen is, especially if you have like, maybe you have a large head and if you, if you kind of, you're moving and you position you, maybe the, maybe the, the head part of the bee suit gets pushed back. So your face is closer to the veil than it otherwise would be. You can get stung through the veil. And this guy did, and it stung him on the lip, which has to be so uncomfortable. Um, and he had like this massive fat lip. Um, it's kind of funny in a way, but it's also like, oh man, I know that that hurt. And he was laughing about it. He thought it was funny, but because um, if you're a beekeeper, you're going to get stung. And we'll talk about that later. Um, but so we pull off all the honey supers, put them in, uh, load them up in our car as we go. And uh, it went really well this year. I mean, we've had other years where we were, I think was, the experience helps, you know, and we got into a rhythm of how we were going to get the bees off and separate them out and put the hives back together. And it's also, we went really early. So we were, we were done by nine o'clock and that was good because right around nine o'clock, it started to warm up a little bit and the bees were starting to come out more. Um, but there'll be bees that are actively trying to make honey while we are taking the boxes. So we have to like literally take them off, brush them off and put them back in the hive. And so then we got them and then we stopped off on the way out. They were having at the ranch that we we're at, they were having, um, uh, a special pollinator day. So they were literally, um, they had a bunch of volunteers out and they were going to be planting a bunch of flowers to help with pollination to help with the bees. So we were there at the right time. And so we went over and gave a little talk and my husband did cause he's awesome and, um, showed a frame full of what a frame full of honey looks like, how heavy it is, you know, all these different things. And, um, and, uh, so we stayed there for a little bit to talk to everybody. So, you know, this is why you're doing it and this is what happens and blah, 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 all these great things. And then, um, and so, uh, well, it's not just why, I mean, the honey is not just the reason, but it's one reason. And, um, we came home and we started working. <sighs> we got home at about 11, I think, 1030, maybe 1030. We didn't stop working until about 7:30 last night. We worked except for a short break for lunch. We worked the entire day on this stuff. Um, thank goodness that the electrical extractor was as good as everyone said it was. Um, it was impressive. Um, we've the, so the way the, the way the extraction works is you have to start by doing what we call uncapping the honey. So bees will place some beeswax and basically sort of like a capping material on top of the honey to hold it in place and protect it. And then they'll come back to it when they need it later on down the road for food. But they basically somehow magically know when it's the right amount of honey, it's thick enough and it's ready to be capped and they'll take care of that for us. But we have to remove the caps, otherwise we can't get the honey out. So we start by taking a sort of like a scraper. It's like a comb in a sense, the metal's comb. And we scrape across the honey cells and break open the caps and from there and from there we uh, then we do it on both sides because honey frames have honey on both sides and place them into the extractor now this the old-fashioned extractor we had was the manual one and that was a pain in the butt um, because for one, you can only do two frames at a time and it required, um, a person to basically manually like crank the, um, kind of like, remember like the old fashioned ice cream churners, um, before the electro ones came along and you would have to just crank, 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 um, to spin it. And that's, that's what the manual one did. And it would take, it would, it would have taken, we, we'd still have a full day of honey extraction today, basically. Um, and so we, uh, 
I had four frames that we could put in this electrical extractor. Ow. And uh, so we put them in, and it took a little finagling because um, it didn't work perfect at first. My husband had to kind of jimmy around with it a little bit because basically it needs to be able to rock just a little bit. But we got the hang of it after a bit, and in the end, it was it didn't rock because of what we, I don't know, there's, there's a whole thing. There's going to be a B video about it at some point, but um, in the end, it worked fantastically. Um, it was the best ever um, because my husband could, what it enabled us to do was to separate jobs. And so my husband would pull out the frames, decap them, put them in the... Um, um, put them in the extra, uh, extractor and then start spinning them down. And then he would have them at a certain speed. And then as more honey came out and the frames got lighter, you could spin them at a higher speed without the extractor kind of going all wonky. So he would kind of do this process where he would like raise the speed up every so many seconds and whatnot and, um, and do that. And then so the honey hits the sides of the extractor, gets thrown out by a centrifugal force, and then it drains down to the bottom of the floor. And once it reaches a certain height down there, so hold on, I'm just, I got a little piece of, a little piece of extra stuff, something there. I'm just going to stitch over it. Um, and once you, uh, oh, sorry, the back, um, let me get a drink here. Once you get to a certain point where it's full in the bottom, where the bottom, the bottom basically creeps up to the point where the spinning frames, where it's going to impact the spinning frames, that's when we have to start emptying it. And so we have these five gallon food grade buckets that have what they call honey gates in the front. And um, it's basically like a, a stopper with a valve so that we can open and close and let the honey out. Um, so what we do is we uh, fill up a five gallon, well, well we put a filtration, um, what do you call it? It's a cheesecloth basically, um, very fine cheesecloth and it's kind of elastic and we hang it over, the, put it on the bucket so that you can push down into the bucket and put the honey in and it, the, the weight of the honey will come in, and that will actually help it filtration or filter through the cheesecloth. And, but it takes a while. It's a very slow, the honey is very thick, and it's a very slow process. So um, that's really what slowed us down the most was just, we in the end, we had to go out and get more buckets because we're like, well, this is just taking, and we, every year, like, we end up having to run out. I think every harvest we've had to run out and get something during the, actual harvesting day. My husband always has to do it because he has to go all the way over the other side of town to, um, and when I say the other side of town, I'm saying the other side of Denver to go get um, stuff. And um, so we had to get more buckets because that was really hampering us uh, speed-wise towards the end. Um, and then once it filters down to the bottom of the buckets, um, then that's I would take the, well, I would help him with the, the pouring of the honey into the, from the extractor into the buckets, into the cheesecloth, and then I'll take the buckets of honey, put them up on our counters, and then when the time came that they could, um, like enough honey had come through the cheesecloth, then I would start filling up the bottles, or the jars, you could say, the honey jars, and we had three buckets going, so basically it was... I mean, we were both constantly working, and so I would work on one bucket and fill and then move to another bucket and fill, and then we'd have to fill up another one, and then it was just, it, it was just a nonstop process, and um, pretty cool. And when we got done, we pretty much got done at a point where we had finished all the frames, and we had put all the honey into the buckets to filter as much as we could, and then we just, we left everything overnight to continue to, to filter. And, and that's kind of where we're at this morning. We let it filter overnight. We're still going to let it continue to filter and kind of go from there. And, um, so yeah, so should be fun. 
Should be fun. And so, uh, so I was able to uh, fill the jars as we went. And this year, what we decided to do was, in the past years, we've done all these different sizes of jars. And honey, raw honey, roughly, should go for about a dollar an ounce, a dollar a fluid ounce, um, based on the effort that's put into it, just everything that goes into it. That's usually... So if you find, like, roadside honey or farmer's market honey that is cheaper than that, go for it. But don't be surprised if it's more expensive than that, because that's just sort of the general, like, financial tip as far as that's concerned. And so... Um, and we were able to fill up 12 ounce bottles. We filled about 125 yesterday. Came out to about 96 pounds of honey in the end when we calculated the whole thing. And we still have more to fill. So we're hoping we might be able to get over 100 pounds of honey when it's all said and done. And then, so we're gonna, um, we're gonna do that. We're gonna slap some labels on uh, today. And, um, so we are progressing, but we still got more to fill. My husband um, drove, uh, he took all the honey frames, all 10 boxes of honey frames, and he took them back down to the hives, um, just left a little while ago. Um, one, to kind of get them out of the kitchen, because the kitchen is just filled with bee extraction equipment. And two, we got to take the, the, those back to the bees so that they can um, take the honey off of it um, use it for energy, put it back in the hive, whatever they want to do. Um, but they'll clean all those hives for us. So we'll be able to bring them back here and store them in a way that, um, we'll be able to, uh, keep them safe and safe for the winter. And then when the bees are ready, we'll put them back out again and, uh, they can get started again. So, yeah. It was, it's fun. I mean, it's fun. It was hard work yesterday, though, and we're still, we're still suffering for it today, but we are more than happy to do it. We love the whole concept. We love helping out just everything, and um, the whole, I mean, it's such a fascinating process, and um, if I had more time, I would be fleshing out that B website that I don't, I have the domain, I just don't have the website fleshed out yet, but I need to put some stuff on it up on it now. I need to put some videos together of um, what we did. And, um, but it's awesome. It's awesome, dude. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. But that's B stuff. Let's talk about docs and stuff. So I got the floss in this week from Gecko Rouge. Thank you guys so much. Um, got that all in, and the other night, I think it was Thursday night, I spent some time putting everything, um, not everything, I didn't have everything, I still, um, have a few bits of floss to put into the, the bags that I had already made, like, I made these bags, this is a really old, this is like the first bag that I ever used, because the other ones look different than this one, but, look, 13, 13, 13, docks, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's obviously this color, it's the most common See, it's even this, 13. And I still have another packet of this um, from the other project that I found that I still need to use. <clears throat> and so, oops, my needle. So, um, yeah, so I got, ah, got that worked on. And just super happy to get started on this thing again, guys. I mean, I cannot tell you how happy I am. <sighs> Five bucks says the dachshund piece will pop out now that I started, but I don't care. I'm, I really think that doing this on 14 count was what I should have done in the first place. And um, for my other Gecko Rouge piece that I have, um, I will definitely switch over to whenever I get to that piece. Well, it'll be a while, but whenever I get to that piece, I'll do that. Here we go. Ah, so that was good. Um, I definitely got, I got a lot of stitching done this past week. I think I'm definitely going to be lighter on the stitching this week just because of spent the, since we spent the entire day on 
B stuff yesterday, and I still got a lot of stuff to do today. I got the, the videos put together, and I got stitching videos to do, and um, hopefully have hope I hope to have all the video stuff done by noon, and then I can work on some other things. Um, probably still work on the B stuff, um, to be honest with you, for probably half the day. Oh yeah, I gotta tell you about getting stung. Um, but I got a lot to do. Ah. Oh, I'm scratching where I got bit. So here's the ironic thing about the bee stings. People always are like, do beekeepers get stung? Oh, man, we get stung all the time. And by we, I mean my husband. Um, I don't go down nearly as much, so I don't get stung. Although he did a really great job this year. Once he got that full body suit, beekeeping suit, with the veil, with the big hooded veil, um, he really hardly got bit this year, which is good because he gets pretty strong reactions. Um, so we were hoping that by using the veils this time that we would not um, have any issues with that. And sure enough, we get through the whole process. Um, and we, like, we, we put everything in the car, and we're just, you know, for all the time that we were down there and doing everything, we're like, wow, we didn't get bit. And that's awesome. And... We um we kept our, we keep our suits on for a while um even once we leave we we drive out to the main area and then open the car back up let the bees out if there are any bees and there really weren't that many bees that we saw a few bees here and there that were in the car um which is amazing considering our struggles in the past with that but we took off our bee suits to talk to all the people that were there and um for the pollination event. And then we got back in the car and we drove home. And we're getting close to home and Mark makes the comment. He says, Wow, we didn't get we didn't get stung in that entire process. Wow, that was really awesome. And I'm like, Yeah, that's amazing. I can't believe that. And uh and the whole time we hadn't you know, there might have been a few we knew that there might still be a few bees here and there, like still back in the back in the um in the frames somewhere that just were stragglers and hung on, but we didn't, we weren't, we didn't see any bees like up in the windows. We didn't see any, like trying to make their way up towards where we were. Um, we didn't see anything like that. And so we were like literally like five minutes from home. And all of a sudden I felt a bee up in my, uh, jeans in the leg of my jeans. And it was like almost to my knee and I was like, oh, shoot. And I grabbed my pants to pull up my, um, uh, pull up the jeans, and he stung me right then. And I was like, oh, dang it. And so I pulled it up, and literally, like, when, when bees sting, uh, the stinger itself is kind of barbed because they're like, they're going to get you. When they're going to get you, they're going to get you. And the, if you've ever heard of, you know, when a bee stings you, it dies. So it's like they're literally like, giving themselves to protect the hive kind of thing. And I took pictures of this because you know, I've never seen it, although I've seen it in pictures and everything, but he literally did that. Like it, because what happens is, is that their stinger is actually attached into their abdomen. And so when they, when they sting and then they get pulled away or they fall away or whatever, the stinger stays and it's actually connected to their like abdomen contents and whatnot, their intestines and whatnot. And so um, when he fell off, all his guts were still hanging off the stinger. And thankfully I was able to get the stinger out pretty quickly. Um, but I took, I had to take some pictures of it because I was like, that's, that's something that you don't often see. So I took some Allegra right away and, uh, but it still got itchy and a little swollen and I should have taken some Allegra last night and I just forgot. Um, woke up this morning and it's, I mean, and it was, it gets hard and it's swollen and, um, so I'll, I, like I said, I took some Allegra, I'll put some steroid cream on it. It'll feel better, but it's just itchy right now. And it's just annoying. And so, but the husband didn't get stung. We were like, that's great because he gets stung all the time. Not all the time, but he's been stung in the past and he's been stung to the point where he's had some pretty good swelling areas. So we're, ex we're, we're finishing all the extraction and we're literally like, we're done with all the spinning and the extraction and everything. And my husband is like, okay, I'm just, he's cleaning up 
and he's stacking the frames and the, you know, all these different things and whatnot and putting the extractor over the side. I mean, literally, like, he's two seconds from, like, okay, and done as far as everything he needs to do to clean up. And it was literally at the and, and he got stung. Um, somehow there was one straggler bee, because we didn't see any, but there was one straggler bee that was in the bottom of something. And when he was stacking it, it came out and stung him, like, right on the finger. And, um, oh, he was mad. I would be mad, too. I mean, we had made it that far, and then he gets stung. It was, that was just ridiculous. And, um, so we immediately, you know, he took a couple of Allegra. We put some cream on it. And even with that, he woke up and his, like, knuckles all, like, swollen up this morning. So we took some more Allegra. But he, he's going to be just fine. We, um, we take his bee stings and mine, honestly, very seriously. And so... Um, so we're, we, we're patient, and, but it does make you feel kind of cruddy afterwards. Um, it stimulates that immune system so much of yours that you just feel tired. And we went to bed at about 8.15 last night <laughs> and we got up at like six o'clock this morning and went to the store. So, um, it's all good. Um, the other thing that happened yesterday that was kind of funny was, uh, I was supposed to get up at about six. My husband ended up getting up at about four because Mercury the cat just wakes him up every single day. He won't let him sleep at a, after a certain point. Um, he just plays with him. He just does stuff to him. So usually Mark has to get up and go downstairs and sit in a chair and sleep down there for a little bit. And um, he was literally like getting up to come upstairs to like take a shower so we could and then make sure that I was awake and I hadn't my alarm didn't go off and uh it was supposed to go off at six and it just it didn't go off for some reason and um come to find out that the power went off like right when my alarm was supposed to go off and and for whatever even though it was on it was plugged in it was a cell phone it didn't go off I don't know what happened but um so but he was like literally like coming upstairs and all of a sudden all the power in the house went off we were like shoot like what what's going on? And I'm like, have I paid the power bill? Um, I'm like, well, they wouldn't turn it off on a Saturday morning without putting a notice on our door or something. Um, and we look outside and, you know, it's still like, it's, it, Dawn has, you know, approached or whatever, but you could still see that nobody else's, nobody's lights were on. The front lights weren't on on anybody's and it was quiet. And sure enough, like not just our area, but like it was a pretty sizable area. I mean, there was like maybe 20,000 people that were affected by this. I don't know what happened, but all the um, like the local grocery stores were out. I mean, everybody was out. Oh, and the gas pumps. We need to get gas. And we had to drive to the other side of town to where they had electricity to get gas. Um, thankfully, we weren't running on empty. But um, but yeah, that was kind of funny. And um but yeah, it was just the street lights were out and it was crazy. And uh, they got it up a couple hours later, but um, we were already down. We were down. And our, our theory was that the bees had sent a commando group out to try to derail us from coming down and collecting the honey. They had somehow damaged a transformer or something important and threw the electricity off, and but it didn't work. And then they sent more commandos to sting us on the way home to enact revenge. And that, that, that did help. That Their cause, that helped. But anyway, that was pretty weird. Because, I, I mean, I can probably count on one hand the number of times that electricity has gone off um, since I've been in this house for, like, the last 15 years. So um, it's usually quite reliable. Everything's underground. So, um, but, yeah. Anyway, so that was fun. Not really, but it was funny. And uh, all right, last up to talk about aquariums. So like I told you guys last week, um, so I had ordered this. Uh, I almost got a whole, it's like 90 stitches right there. Uh, I had ordered this really great deal in this 50-gallon tank, acrylic tank, which is lighter and more durable than glass. And I really wanted acrylic tanks because my, my glass ones are so heavy to do anything with. And I had ordered one, and it had taken a very circuitous, 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 you know what I'm trying to say, a circle route. It took a long time to get to me. And 
it went all over local area and I was like, it's never going to get to me. It's stuck in Amazon now. There's no delivery date. It missed its delivery before. They're not telling me anything about when it's coming. So let me just, let me just get a replacement. Well, that's what Amazon told me to do is get a replacement, talk to customer service. And they said, we'll do that. We'll get your replacement. No worries. And then a couple of days later, both of the aquariums show up, both the new replacement and the older tank that I had ordered. And I was like, well, shoot. And, uh, and I, it doesn't sit well with us that something that expensive, well, it's not that expensive. It was a couple hundred bucks, but, um, it is and it isn't. And so, um, it's one of those things that we, we always think about the little man in the business, you know, as far as the person who owns the company and did they have to, um, did Amazon cover the cost of that lost, um, like, did they pay the sh the shipper back? Did they pay the company back that sent that tank? Did they pay them for the tank that they lost in transit? And we don't. I don't know if that's the case or not. But I'm like, I don't want that company to be out a whole fifty gallon tank. That's not right. So plus, you never know if say you're like, woohoo, I got a free tank. Well, Amazon does some kind of audit and then discovers that a month later, and then they get mad at you because you need to pay them money, and I don't know, anyway, I was just like, you know what, let's do the right thing, karma is real, let's, you know, let's be, let's be good here, and do the right thing, so, reached out to them, and paid for the second tank, um, so I got two tanks sitting downstairs in their boxes, I haven't opened them up yet, um, this week we'll be putting one up, um, I'm gonna have to order another stand, too, um, but, uh, it's okay. It's going to be better. It's going to be a lot better for the fish. They're going to be really happy. So um, we're going to get all that squared away. I did talk about that in the uh, vlog this past week that I did. Um, but anyway, so we got that going on. So much going on, dudes. This is going to be a nappy day. I'm definitely going to be taking a nap sometime today. I'm going to miss some football. I didn't get to watch any college football yesterday. I tried listening to a little bit of it here and there, and every team that was getting blown out was supposed to get blown out, so it's all good. You know, I didn't even find out if Georgia won or not. Huh. I guess I'll find out when I finish this video. They were up like 13 to 10 in the third when I went to bed, and I was like, I can't stay up. This game's on too late. It's like, it's like 8.30. <laughs> this game's on too late. And uh, I had to go to sleep. Oh, I was so tired. And, uh, oh, it's so worth it. And the honey tastes amazing. It's like wildflower honey. It's so amazing. The best ever. So we're super happy about it. Super happy, super proud. Ah. Super hungry too. Doing such a t terrible job this week on eating properly. And right now I don't care because we're so busy that I'll just do whatever I got to to uh, get to a point where we'll eat a little better. But like we ordered pizza yesterday because we're like, I mean, we had I, there's there's honey stuck everywhere in the kitchen, and that's the other thing that I got to do. When both well, my husband cleaned up so much yesterday, but I gotta clean like the floors and stuff and get the carpet cleaner out and do all that and get some of that honey up if I can. And uh it's just it's everything's sticky. I got clothes are sticky. I went to I went to take a shower last night after everything and I had honey stuck all in my hair and I you can't brush it. You can't brush it out. You just gotta you know, honestly just um hot water hot water and shampoo would just come right out no big deal but on top of that when I my hands were so raw at that point and um I'm still not even 100% sure like why my hands were so raw like I don't know what what aspect of what I was doing that caused that but and you could say hey wear gloves well the gloves when they get sticky they're even worse than human hands human hands like we also washed our hands like 30 times each yesterday. It was just, it, once you get your hands so sticky, you just got to wash all the honey off and start fresh. And, um, 
if you were wearing gloves, you know, you're, you're changing gloves every two minutes because they're constantly getting sticky. And so, and that would be, that's really annoying more so than anything else. But yeah, so tired. So tired. But anyway, it's all good, dudes. It's all good. Get everything kind of put back together today. It'll be fun. It'll be fun to. It's always fun to get things done. I think so. Be to feel accomplished because not feeling accomplished, feeling non non accomplished, unaccomplished, un like feeling the to-do list growing and growing is very frustrating to me and it provokes some anxiety and oh but it's good stuff dudes it's good stuff so i think we're gonna, we're gonna stop a little earlier today we're gonna finish up this um video with this floss in 120-ish ish stitches or so because I just I'm starting to feel like I gotta get downstairs for number one I'm starving so I gotta get down and eat some breakfast and I gotta get some things done on the floors before hubby comes back because Mark can't stand to have the dogs be put up. He's so sweet. I'm okay with it because I can get him out of the way and get things done. And then I let him out later. But they can't be out while I'm doing the floors because they just get in the way. And Zuzu is is being a real pain. She was we had a, I had to leave her up. We had to leave her up all day yesterday or most of the day yesterday because she didn't we had a gate up to block them off from coming up into the kitchen and she kept testing the gate constantly even though we would tell her no she just I gotta be with people and um, so we eventually had to put her up because it just wasn't wasn't working because then the dogs go running up they get in the middle of our honey process they're licking the honey they didn't lick any honey that we bottled okay that didn't happen because that's not in a place where they can do it but there's honey on the floor and there's just and they just get sticky, and you just worry that they're going to knock stuff over, and it's just, it was stressful. Oh. So. Ah. Come here, you. So we got our first stitches done again with Dachshund. How awesome is that, guys? How awesome is that? So. Other thing I want to talk about real quick. And so I see this on my comments and I see this on other people's comments um, or posts on Stitch Mania or the other Facebook groups that are out there. And one of the things that people get discouraged by is when they are working on a project, especially if they've been working on it for a while, and they realize they've made some mistake that's going to require them to have to remove a significant amount of stitches for them. And whether that's 50 stitches or whether that's 500 stitches for them, for them it's discouraging. And they think, I should just start over. Or no, I shouldn't start over. I should just do something else. I'm done. I can't do this project. Um, just, you know, forget it. And I'm done. And I'll say to that, I get you. Dudes have been there. Obviously, I had to start. I was... I was on page two. I was like over here on this and I lost the original. I, again, I don't know how I lost it. I don't know where it is. I don't know what happened, but it's gone. So the thought was, well, I could just not do it. You know, well, I guess that project's done. I'll move on to something else. But I really, really wanted to do this piece. I really want to get this one done. So, and and I've had pieces, you know, old, old World Map 2 where I've had like, 500 stitches on a page and realized that I had been stitching the wrong page um, on that piece and I had to take every little stitch out and start over. Um, long term, short term, it's a pain. Short term, it's discouraging and it's frustrating and you feel like you're going backwards instead of going forwards with something. But 
it's important to push through those things. It's important, you know, it's important in life, but it's also important just for your cross stitching hobby because you are going to make mistakes. You're going to have to take apart things that you've worked so hard to get to that point. You know, sometimes you have to do that and it, it stinks, but just do it. You know, it, it's, it, if it, if it's so frustrating, I'll do that sometimes. I'll put it aside for a while until I get the, the, the motivation to get back to it and then frog and then start over. Um, you don't have to just turn right around and start right over unless that's your only piece, but, but whatever works for you, but don't give up. If it's something that you really want to do, go back, fix the stuff, you know, take everything out that you got to and start over. And a lot of that is it makes you better at stitching because it makes you more careful. It makes you be able to catch mistakes earlier than next time. But if you do it and then if you make it, if you, you're stitching and then you make your mistake and you're just like, well, toss it, you haven't really learned anything, you know, by taking everything down and starting back over. Oh, you learn, <laughs> you learn, um, and you get better at what you're doing. So I, you know, don't give up, don't give up, keep working at it. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be okay. And when you're done, you'll feel even better because of the extra time it took and the, and the struggles that it took, you know, anything that takes it, that's harder to do and takes longer to do is worth doing dudes. So you're all good. You're going to be fine. So, that's my little soapbox moment, I suppose, besides the beginning. I'm going to use that beginning part, I think, and splice it together a little bit and make a different video out of it for folks, um, show folks how to start a project and how to grid and all that, because I still get a lot of questions about that. All right, time to go downstairs, get this video loaded, get a bunch of other videos loaded. I'll link to the B channel down below as well if you want to follow that. I'll link to it as well later in the... Um, later in the year, or later in the year, later in the week, um, I'm going to do another um, cross-stitch pattern site video. I'll record it this morning. I don't know. I haven't decided who I'm doing. I might do Gecko Rouge. I might wait a little bit, though, because they're they're in the middle. They're catching up. They've been behind. I don't want them to get, if they got a bunch of orders, I don't want them to get flooded just yet. So I'm going to pick somebody else um, for now, maybe do a smaller site and show you guys some more stuff, but it's fun. It's fun to do the videos, and I find things that I'm like, ooh, I kind of want that, um, even though I don't need it. I, I, you know what? It was so funny last night when we finished the honey, and I felt like I, we have accomplished so much. We have done so much. I have worked so hard today, and I deserve, I deserve something awesome. And I was like, I'm going to go buy a cross-stitch pattern. <laughs> I literally was like, I'm going to go buy this. And um, I didn't. I stopped myself. But that was funny. That was what I wanted to do to reward myself. And uh, today I bought a thing of cookies. And so today is going to be actually eating cookies. That's what I'm going to do. But, oh, guys. All right. I'm going to take some leave and get working on all this. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, ask them down below. I am way behind on my questions. That's another thing I need to work on today. I have a lot to do. I got to get going. I'll see you guys later and have a great day. Happy stitching.